This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Engage. Engage is a digital booking platform revolutionizing the talent booking industry. With thousands of athletes, celebrities, entrepreneurs, and business leaders, Engage is the go-to spot for booking talent, for speeches, custom experiences, live streams, and much more. For more information on Engage or to book talent today, visit letsengage.com. Welcome to another edition of the Impact Podcast. I'm John Shigarian, and I'm so excited to have with us today Dr. Meng Tao. He's a distinguished professor at, of sustainability and innovation at Arizona State University. Welcome to the Impact Podcast. Thank you, John. Thank you for having me. Oh, well, it's an honor to have you today. Your work, you've done so much hard work in this, in this, and research in this area of uh, sustainability and innovation. But before we start talking about all your fascinating work with regards to solar technologies and other technologies, I'd love you to share your fascinating background of your journey, where you grew up, where you got educated and how you came to this important work that you do. Yeah, sure. Uh, this is a long story. And uh, I came to this country in 1992. So I spent the first half of my life in China and the second half of my life in the US. And I got a bachelor degree and master degree in China. And then I decided to pursue my PhD here in the US. So I still remember that uh, when I boarded a flight from Shanghai to San Francisco, I had $60 in my pocket. That's all the money I had. And I had to borrow money to buy my ticket here. Oh. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah, of course the first few years was pretty tough and uh, the financial constraint, the language, the cultural barriers, and then also pressure from the school because uh, uh, all the classes were taught in a different language and uh, uh, I was also working like up to like 40 hours a week uh, doing research in lab uh, because I was financially supported by a research assistantship. So that was like, uh, 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 but I guess more importantly, there was this anxiety, this uncertainty about my future that time. And uh, I wanted to stay, but uh, could I find a job after my PhD? If not, where would I go? And uh, so this was a unsettled time of my life. But uh, yeah, I'm so grateful that this country did provide me opportunities. And uh, I got my PhD in 1998 from the University of Illinois at the Final Champagne and under Professor Joe Lighty. Actually, I noticed he's still there <laughs> today. Wow. Yeah. So then I got my first job as a assistant professor at Louisiana Tech University. And then uh, two years later, I moved to the University of Texas at Arlington. And then in 2011, I came to Arizona State University as a professor in the School of Electrical Computer and Energy Engineering. So I have been here for 10 years now. You know, I always love the immigrant origination story. My family, I'm third generation mm -hmm. uh, immigrant. So to me, I always relate to every immigrant story. If I feel that I'm part of it and I feel that that story is part of, we, it ties us together as a family. When you mm -hmm. left, Shanghai in 1992, were you the only family member in your family that came here or did you already have family and friends here? Yeah, uh, my sister came to United States in 1987. Wow. So that, when I said I borrowed the money, I borrowed the money from my sister. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. She was already here. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. she's still alive and she's still here in the United States? Yeah, they live in Minnesota. Wonderful, wonderful. Mm -hmm. So good, you had your sister here, got it. Yeah, 
Yeah. Uh, otherwise, it would be even more difficult. Yeah. Wow. Without. Yeah, I can imagine. And so you can, now you're at Arizona State University. I'm on your website, and for our listeners and viewers that want to see the important and great work that Dr. Tao is up to, you could go to sustainability-innovation.asu.edu. Can you talk a little bit about what specifically you work on at ASU and what your passion and your and your focus is? Yeah, sure. Uh, my research focuses on sustainable solar technologies. Now, why I put the sustainable in front of solar technology? So right. I think people may still have the misconception that uh, I have solar panels on my roof, so now I have sustainable energy. Right. Now, what's wrong with that? In fact, we need two things simultaneously in order to have sustainable energy. The first thing we need a sustainable energy source. Solar is certainly sustainable. The second thing, we also need a sustainable technology to utilize that energy source. This is an issue which has been largely overlooked in the past. Mm. Just give you one example. Yes. The end of life solar modules. All solar modules have a finite lifetime, typically 25 years. And uh, what do we do when they die? Now today, most of them go to landfill. So we have to ask ourselves the question, are solar panels really green if they end up in landfill? Right. So that's just one example. There are also other load blocks to sustainable solar technology. Uh, the reason is that the, the amount of energy we use is enormous. Uh, I could give you numbers. Uh, right now, we use the average two times 10 to the power 13 joules of energy every second on average. That's an enormous number. That means solar technology, when we deploy solar technology, these technologies have to be deployed at an enormous scale, comparable to the scale of our demand to make a tangible impact on our carbon emission. Mm -hmm. And uh, that translates into enormous amounts of resources to produce and deploy solar technology. Things like electricity, water, chemicals, raw materials, transportation, storage, recycling, you name it. So we have to ask ourselves the question, do we have enough of these resources on our planet to make all the solar panels that we have to make? And it turns out in many cases, these resources are limited. So that's the focus of my research. Uh, my goal is to find the technical solutions to these resource constraints and make solar technology sustainable. So, Really, you're at the forefront of taking solar technology, which was part of the linear economy historically, and taking now solar technology into the circular economy as well. Yes, exactly. And we want the solar technology to be sustainable so we can use solar energy for, for many decades, many uh, uh, time, long, long time to come. Yeah. So, Doc, what, what is, how far away are we from your goals? You've done lots of research. You've done, uh, you've been cited more than 3,200 times in scientific writings. You're very well esteemed around the world in all of your research. How, what does the road ahead look like? Are there lots of roadblocks or are you more hopeful right now about breaking through than ever before? Yes, there's always hope, but I think we as a human are smart enough to come up with a solution to the problems that we face. And uh, uh, now certainly that doesn't mean that there will be no uh, load blocks, no barriers to achieve our goal. 
I think the end game is that uh, by 2050, a significant portion of the energy we use must come from solar. Okay. And now we also have other renewable energy sources like a wind, like a, 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 a geothermal, like a biomass. Then we also have low carbon energy sources like nuclear energy. Uh, but the solar has to play the leading role in solving our uh, 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 energy crisis. And so that means that to deploy solar technology at a, a large enough sufficient scale and the load blocks we face like raw materials, like electricity, uh, like storage, like recycling, all these need to be, we need to work out the solution to these problems. But I'm optimistic that uh, when we put our concerted effort into these issues, these problems will be solved. If today the biggest roadblock to solar panel recycling is that the cost of recycling far exceeds the revenue from the recycling. Mm -hmm. How far away are we from developing these technologies to maximize that revenue and take a solar panel or solar panels or solar farm to the circular economy? Uh Right now in the United States, uh, I must say that the need to recycle solar panels is well recognized, but it is seldom done today. And uh, as you mentioned that the cost for recycling fire exceeds the revenue for recycling by today technology. So it does not make a business sense wow. unless somebody walks in and uh, foots the bill. So how far are we? Right now, I think uh, maybe 10% of the solar panels, end of life solar panels uh, are recycled. Wow. And 90% uh, actually end up in landfill. And uh, even they are recycled, in my view, they are not properly recycled because uh, there are a couple of issues. Uh, one of the issues is that there is a toxic material in solar panels, lead. Each panel contains about a half an ounce of lead and it's a liability issue if it gets into water or soil. Right. And today technology does not allow us to get the lead out. And uh, there's also the encapsulant in solar panels, which is ethylene vinyl acid, which is a polymer. This polymer reacts with water to form acetic acid. And that's the vinegar we, we use at home. But acetic acid is what we use to dissolve lead. So lead and acetylene vinyl acetate are just a really bad combination in modules if you send them to landfill. Right. Yeah, so then there are also other materials in solar panels like silver, copper, aluminum, silicon, glass, tin. So these materials are worth between 10 to $15 per panel. Okay. But the technology we have today only allows us to extract the aluminum and maybe also the copper for about $2 per panel. So we are missing uh, almost 90% of the potential revenue here. So that's what we are focusing on now. I work with my students to develop technologies for solar panel recycling. We have two main objectives. One is to maximize the revenue from solar panel recycling in order to offset the cost. The other is to extract 100% of the lead uh, from modules and then we use that lead in new modules. And uh, because the lead is used in the salt in, in modules. How far are we getting closer? Uh, uh, you know, are we getting closer to this changing of the, yeah. the cost structure of recycling? Do you believe in the next five years, 10 years, we're going to be able to achieve a program and a systemology that allows us to responsibly recycle solar panels economically, efficiently? We have to, we have to. 
and the projection is that by 2030, and that's a five year old report by the International Renewable Energy Agency. Yeah. At that time, 2016, they projected that by 2030, we will see a large quantity of end of life panels. Right. But uh, last week, I had a meeting with uh, 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 Evelyn Butler from Solar Energy Industries Association. Now, their newest projection is that uh, by 2025 to 2027, we will see a large quantity of end of life module. So we have to be ready before that. And uh, I think on the technical side, we're certainly making great progress, but we do need to move to the next stage that is uh, to build a prototype to actually test this out and then to have a provided service to anybody who wants to get their panels recycled. For our listeners and our viewers that have just joined us, we've got Dr. Meng Tao, the very esteemed professor of Arizona State University. You, you can find Dr. Meng and his uh, colleagues at uh, ASU uh, at sustainability-innovation.asu.edu, sustainability-innovation.asu.edu. We're talking about solar panels. We're talking about innovation. We're talking about his important research and, uh, and the technological revolution evolving solar panels to be able to be responsibly recycled in the future instead of being landfilled, which then creates all sorts of hazardous waste opportunities into our ecosystem, our ground, our water, our animals, our vegetation, and eventually, of course, back to human beings. Dr. Tao, talk, tell us a little bit about, you just recently, you're co-founding a company, you're ser serving as a CTO for TG Technologies. What's the goal of TG Technologies and uh, how is that different from the role that you play as a professor and a researcher and a teacher? Yeah, that's a, <laughs> really a, 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 a good question. Yeah, being an engineering professor, I guess my career goal is to solve maybe one practical problem for the society. And uh, so that's why I co-founded this TG uh, company. And uh, the company's mission is to commercialize uh, innovative and green technologies for sustainable solar technology. So right now it uh, focuses on uh, solar panel recycling technology and uh, it got uh, uh, the federal government gives this what they call SBR grant, small business innovation research uh, projects. And uh, so company received the both phase one and phase two for uh, the National Science Foundation total being almost uh, like a million dollars. And uh, so we have come up with a circular chemistry to recycle solar panels. Now, what does circular chemistry mean? Typically, you process these panels, then you generate tons and tons of chemical waste. Right. How can we, not we want solar panels to be circular, but can we have the recycling process circular as well? So that's what, how we got started with this. Now we figure out a way to basically we generate, we use the chemicals we use for recycling. So the way we do it is that we first dissolve the metals uh, from solar panels in chemicals, then we extract the metals from the chemicals. And uh, during metal extraction, the chemicals get regenerated and then we use them to dissolve metal again. So that's how we can cut down chemical waste by like 80% from the recycling process. So we have, I believe the best, uh, most environmentally benign recycling process with this company with the support from our National Science Foundation. Wow. So it's sort of a closed loop recycling system. Yes, that's exactly. How long are you from commercializing that invention and that those technologies? Are you a year away or five years away? What's your thoughts? Uh, 
Now we are actively uh, talking with potential investors. So our next goal is to build up a, a small scale, maybe roughly a hundred ton a year type of facility, which is about uh, maybe a hundred thousand panels a year type of capabilities to prove that uh, what we have from bench top research actually is feasible and you know, usable scale. And from that point on, uh, so that's probably, I would say, maybe two or three years away. And that will be in Arizona, that first plant? Uh, that's a good question. That's still being discussed. And uh, Arizona certainly takes care of Southern California, Nevada, Arizona, all the solar panels installed in this region. But it could be in some way in Texas that also takes care of the, the southern part of the United States, or even like a, like a, a Georgia, which takes care of southeast United States. So that's the loca exact location is still being uh, uh, discussed, right. debated there. Doc, uh, you know, you are also a teacher of students, mm -hmm. and ASU is a wonderful learning institution especially mm -hmm. your Global Institute of Sustainability and Innovation mm -hmm. has a world known record. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's world known in, their, in the importance of what you teach in sustainability is, is you were early, your Global Institute of Sustainability and Innovation at ASU was early uh, in teaching this. Mm. Is, is almost the, all the stars aligning now like, are, are, is everything coming together? Because it seems as though we can't turn on CNBC or Bloomberg or CNN and another stories about sustainability, ESG, green innovation, um, infrastructure. Uh, the, President Biden's infrastructure program is all about green innovation. Mm. Are your students now the next dot com rock stars of the future? Are they going to make fortunes as we turn the linear economy to the circular economy over the next decade? Yeah, that's certainly a very important point. And uh, uh, I have a couple of things to say to, to, to your point. One is that uh, I spent a year in Sweden between 2017, 2018 as the full bright distinguished chair. So I went to Sweden uh -huh. in the United States. And the one thing I noticed is that the Europeans or Swiss are doing a much better job in terms of circular economy than United States. Uh, give you one example, they are recycle bin. There are six or eight different boxes, one for colored glass, one for non-colored glass, one for metal, one for paper, one for Cowboys and so they do this. Every citizen, every citizen does this sorting. So the recyclers don't have this heavy burden of sorting different things out. So that's the one thing. That's that's also gets into the your, your point of we need to educate the, our next generation uh, in, in, in that direction. The other point I want to add to 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 uh, your comment is that. Uh, I was educated in the 1980s, 1990s. At that time, we were so sharp on technical advances without considering all the environmental, social, societal consequences of the new technologies we were developing. Yeah, so circularity was not into the initial design or development of a new product. And that attitude has to change. I'm glad that SEO is taking a leading position in doing that, trying to convey the message of circularity and sustainability into the everything we teach. And uh, yeah, so we will have a new generation who is well knowledgeable and capable of pushing for circular economy. I want to ask you a question, though. I want to mm. see if you agree with my theory. Uh, I assume that you and I both love uh, two great countries, China and the United States. We love them, but uh, they're very big land masses. 
Mm. So go back to what you just said about Sweden. It's been my theory all along that Sweden, Germany, Italy, France, UK, and then when we look to the other side, Japan, South Korea, these countries have been generationally ahead of us, as you pointed out, with regards to sustainability and circular economy behavior. Because they've been forced to, they have small geographies, they can't go build more landfills. Whereas you said, we were so interested in advancing our societies in China and the US, we weren't thinking in those terms. Plus we also had the land mass to just say, just dig more landfills, just, <laughs> just use it once, throw it out, don't worry about taking mm. those resources and reusing them again. But mm. now finally, both China, the United States, thank gosh, are getting on board with what the EU mm. and, what, and what other smaller countries in Asia have been doing for at least two generations historically. Mm. Is, that, mm. is that sort of along the lines of the, how you see this as well? Yeah, I definitely agree with you that the uh, United States uh, and uh, we have not really had uh, real tough times or live on the extremely limited resources. So we tend to buy a big house if we can, buy a big car if we can. And uh, if we just look at the, the cities we have, they are so spread out. Phoenix, if you drive from east to west, that's like uh, 80 miles. Right, right. Yeah, the city I stayed in, Gothenburg in Sweden, uh, it probably has like a, on the order of maybe million, one million people. Really? But the city is really, really concentrated. East to west, no more than like 10, 15 miles. So now it's probably difficult to have a public transportation system in such a sparsely populated uh, regions. But in Sweden, it makes perfect sense. So everybody just you don't need a car to live in the city and you just hop on a bus or a tram and then it will take you almost anywhere. But in the US, you can see that if I travel from the east side of Phoenix to the west side of Phoenix, I will go through 80 miles and uh, it's kind of difficult to run a public transport system in, in such a big city like that. Yeah. So I, I agree with you. And But uh, now, we probably need to rethink about, about these things and uh, uh, see how we can better design our cities uh, to be more sustainable. And uh, if we continue to take this attitude, it will come back and uh, bite us. For example, the plastic, plastic waste you know well. And uh, yeah, that's the same attitude. Uh, oh, let's just throw it out. Uh, yeah, nature will take care of it. Eventually it can come back and uh, now it's the problem we have to deal with. How about with solar panels? There's so much debate that I always hear uh, uh, Dr. Tao over who should pay for the responsible recycling? Is it the manufacturer? Is it the state that they're used in? Is it no. other stakeholders that use these on their homes or in their businesses? <laughs> who really is responsible? What's your thoughts on that? Because you're such an expert in this area. I'd love to hear your thoughts on who should be paying for the responsible recycling of, of solar panels. Okay, good, really good question. And uh, in EU, they mandate uh, the manufacturers to pay for recycling end of life management. And in the US, now it's largely left to the waste generator, basically the panel owners and uh, who are responsible, but there's no mandate here. So that's why most solar panels end up in landfill. I see the advantage of putting that responsibility on the manufacturer instead of on the uh, uh, customers or the users. Because if you put this on the manufacturers, then they have to take uh, recyclability into their design. While if the customers are responsible, right, manu especially these manufacturers largely are overseas. Right. And then also these panels last for 25, 30 years. 30 years later, that manufacturer may be out of business. You have nobody to go after. Right. And uh, yeah, so it seems like also to 
be able to recycle these solar panels, we also need to have the basic information. What's the structure, what type of materials are in there, what's concentration, relative concentration of each material, where these materials stay inside the panel. Now this information is totally missing on the panel. So some 25 years later, you get these panels. You don't know what's inside the panel because each manufacturer may have different structure, may have a slightly different material. Then recyclers job becomes extremely difficult in that scenario. Right. Yeah, so I hope that if we put this on uh, manufacturers' shoulder, then they have to behave a little bit more responsibly than they have been behaving you know, up right. to this point, yeah. You know, Doc, we're at the end of this interview, but I want to give you, I always like for our guests to share some final thoughts and words. And we have a lot of young viewers around the world that are want to be the next generation of entrepreneurs as well. So I'll leave it to you and then I'll say goodbye for both of us at the end. But I, I'd like you to share your last thoughts before we have to sign off for today. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, for the young um, people out there, if you are looking for the next big thing, or uh, if you are looking for the next Intel or Microsoft or Facebook or Google, my bet is it will probably be in energy and uh, secure economy. Wow. Yep, simply because we use so much energy, we need to shift our energy uh, from our fossil fuel to something which is more sustainable. Wonderful. And Doc, I wish you continued success. I hope your company uh, becomes a TG Companies LLC becomes a huge success and we get to create a circular economy of recycling uh, solar panels. And I hope you win that. That would be mm -hmm. wonderful. And for our listeners and viewers who want to find uh, Dr. Tao and his colleagues doing the great work they are at ASU at the Global Institute of Sustainability and Innovation, please go to sustainability-innovation.asu.edu. Dr. Tao, you are truly making a great impact on this planet, making this world a better place. And I'm so honored and grateful that you spent time with us today on the Impact Podcast. Uh, thank you so much, John. And it's a great uh, 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 opportunity for me as well. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Trajectory Energy Partners. Trajectory Energy Partners brings together landowners, electricity users, and communities to develop solar energy projects with strong local support. For more information on how Trajectory is leading the solar revolution, please visit trajectoryenergy.com.